What's up? How's everybody doing? This is Ben. This is my podcast. It's called All Over the Place. And uh, I have my good buddy, Mr. Caleb Johnson, on the line. Woo! <laughs> I love this guy. I'm going to give everybody a brief, a brief synopsis of, of, of Caleb Johnson. If you don't already know his name, it should be a household name. It is in my house. We, oh. uh, it is, you know. It's a weird thing. I won't go into why it's a household name. It's not. It has, it has nothing to do with role playing at all. But uh, <laughs> it's no. Caleb Johnson uh, is. He's your friend. He's my friend. He is uh, a b- brief background. American Idol winner. Okay, big time, big time, guys, big time here, big time. He also uh, sings for Trans Siberian Orchestra. Okay. Which is, I saw trans Siberian Orchestra, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but I saw them play for, it seemed like five hours one night. And I was like, all right, you know, I love Christmas music, I love metal, but let's go. Hey, it's long. It is <laughs> go. And uh, he also has his own uh, badass band, Caleb Johnson, the Ram- Ramblin' Saints. And and you sent me demos of your stuff early on, too, which I love. And we'll, again, we'll touch on that. And you had the distinct honor to sing in the Meat Lo- in the Meatloaf Band. I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, who does that? Who does that all? At, how old are you? Apparently me. Uh, I just turned 29. You're 29 and you've done all that. And that, that's that's oh, dumb. Yeah. I'm hanging up. I'm done. And I've gotten a tour with you guys. I mean, what, that's, what's that's, up with that? That's where I was circling back to. So we first met Caleb in 2017. We did, um, uh, yeah, 2017. We were on the Kentucky record. We were touring off that. And we had Caleb come out with us that spring, uh, or end of winter, spring. And we just hit it off great. Uh, Caleb was out there absolutely crushing it every single night. His vocals, just killing it. His band was amazing. His dad was out there, which was awesome. <laughs> it was it was the coolest thing to have you out there because you were, at the time, really trying to break out and, and be your own dude. You know what I mean? And which you were. You know, and it was awesome to see that. It was awesome to see you tear up the stage. And then you got up and played with us, uh, and uh, we did Marshall Tucker every night. That was awesome. That was yeah, so that much was fun. fun. That was that so was much fun. that was that was killer. I want. We need to do that again, by the way, when this is all over with. I would love to, man. Well, yeah, we that was a lot of fun. We, we sent an email about having you on some shows this uh, spring, but whoops. <laughs> Yeah, everything shut down. Yeah, I know, I know. Crazy, you know what's crazy? I was actually, and you probably, you guys were probably the same way, but I was en route to do a show with the Ramblin' Saints in Maryland, and we were like on the road. We had been on the road for like five hours, and we pulled off to go stop at a Cracker Barrel, and my agent called. And he's like, "Hey, the show's canceled." He was like, "Everything is now just completely shut down." Yeah. You know, for the probably the rest of this year. And honestly, I, it might even go on into 21. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how long this is going to last, but it was so surreal just getting a call and just being like, cause I had literally just done a show in Nashville the weekend before that. And, and people were kind of like talking about it or whatever. I'm like, ah, you know what? This is probably just some like news thing or whatever. And I, I didn't really like pay attention to what was going on. Cause this is just when the tornadoes had hit in Nashville and all that stuff was happening. And, right. um, it was just kind of like in the distance, and then literally a week later, it was like, bam, and it just hit. And so everything just like put on lockdown, and we went, we drove back home that night. It was that sudden, you know. Yeah. So you you Great. were right there. You were right there in the middle of it, you know, where we were kind of watching it. Like we had lots of friends. Like I know uh, Blackberry Smoke was up in Canada, I think, when it mm-hmm. happened, and they like had to just cancel everything and like take you know get flights out of Canada and come back home, just like you know. I yeah. think we were we were all on the same page, going, okay, what is this? What's going to happen? You know, you know, this is this is going to be over with hopefully soon. And now you see more and more stuff that's getting canceled, and I'm kind of like, oh my gosh. Like, Throughout the year, and I mean, like with with shows in general, with me, like they've all been moved to the back half of the year. But even then, you know, it's like it, I was talking. I think I was actually talking to the agent about this, but we were just talking about, you know is the public going to be safe coming out to shows? Like if there's no vaccine or no, you know, proven thing that's going to help 
you know, nipped us in the butt, there's still going to be that sort of like reservation of like people not wanting to go to shows or people not right. being able to afford to go to shows because they've been out of work for, yeah. you know, months. And like, it's just, cra it's crazy, man. This is the first time I think any of us have experienced something like this on such a grand scale like this. So it's crazy to it's weird. witness it happen and just the uncertainty is really, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. I, know. I'm, I kid you not, like, cause I, I have really bad asthma. Like, yeah. Like I'm super asthmatic. Like I've had upper respiratory infections before, and it's 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 one of the worst feelings in the world to feel like there's like tons of bricks, you know, laying on your chest you can't get a breath in. And I had a really bad allergic reaction like this second to last week of March. And dude, I thought I had I thought I had the virus. I was like freaking out. I was like wanting to go to the ER room, and, and luckily my family was like, you know, you're risking even more, you know. Sure to put yourself in that situation. I went and got a steroid shot to, to bring the inflammation down. I'm way better now, but dude, I was yeah. having panic attacks. I was having anxiety attacks. I thought I was dying. It was, yeah. Crazy. And I've never experienced anything like that, you know, mentally wise ever in my entire life. So it was crazy experience just going through that and just luckily getting out on the other side of that better and, you know, still handling this stuff, but it was just, when that stuff was like really hot, like when the news, like when it was like really kicking off and like all those cases and stuff, I was like losing my mind, dude, because I, I you know, I have asthma, right. super asthmatic, and I'm a high risk for the. Well, and normally, Z let me ask you this: normally, if you had had that kind of asthma attack, you would have probably been like, "Oh, I'm just having, I'm having an asthma attack, and I'll do what yeah, I need I to do." And it would be, it would be fine in in the in like a day or so, because the yeah. steroid brings the inflammation down in the lungs, and so. But it was right. It was during right in the middle of that. And so yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the fear thing of it. anybody, oh, fear, anybody yeah. that had a cough was like, "Well, I'm toast. I'm out of here." <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. But see, this is the other crazy thing too: is that my brother had went to, excuse me, this knife work store in, um, not Gallenberg, but Sevierville, Tennessee. I don't know. The, that's an you know, incredible. At, the Smoky Mountain Knife Works. It's like I, a I Disney World of of knives and swords. Yeah. Yeah. And he he went there that weekend that we came back from the sh from that canceled show and then he got sick. He got, he had like a cold or something. So that I was freaking out because I thought that he had gotten the the virus from being in, in Sevierville where Sevierville I think is where it's at or Bishop yeah, yeah. Ford, whatever. Yeah. And so that was it was just all fuel for the fire and I I I, I kid you not I had never experienced something like that that anxiety attack and panic yeah. attack Crazy. i'm sorry you did I, I hate that but i'm glad you're better yeah me too and, dude that, now, that was now yeah now we just kind of hold on and 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 we're crossing <laughs> we have we have shows too coming up uh, uh well we had them we're supposed to be we we should have just gotten back from japan yesterday and then we're supposed to start a tour with uh alter bridge alter, yeah. on on friday and then and then that's canceled and we had some other stuff come up some skinner dates that were are moved to the yeah. back half so we're still like crossing our fingers we have a uk tour and it's like we have to i have to play a show mentally you know like you know whatever the virus like that's going to be more dangerous for like musicians that you know that rely on besides the financial part of it like mentally you have mentally, to yeah. you have to play you know what i mean it's like yeah what it, are you gonna it, do to me that's doing shows and stuff is like going to church it's like it's like that relief that you get that for people that don't uh, that aren't musicians or performers, they don't you, you truly don't understand it, you know, unless you're like doing it and on stage and like right. it's such a great release and you feel great afterwards and it, it, it definitely attributes to a lot of positive mental uh, health sure aspects, you know, in the music community and then because artists they have to create to yeah to express themselves, so you ha it's just a part of our DNA and you, you know. When that's taken away, that that really is detrimental to a huge part of our our well being. So you definitely, I, I, you know, like you said, like I hope that this definitely gets nipped in the butt, you know, sooner yeah. than. But I say, I say, screw it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's book a show right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are you guys, are you guys gonna do any like live stream stuff? You guys gonna do a uh, like a concert? So Facebook Live or a YouTube Live thing? We we've been doing this, and I, we need to get you on this. Um, we've been we started a thing called Cherry Chat, right? Mm -hmm. And essentially, it's essentially like a podcast, but it's it's all four of us, and then we have other bands come on there, and we just literally talk. It's not so 
interview esque. You know what I mean? And I don't want my podcast to come off like this either. So if it ever does, be like, dude, I'm not answering that question. You know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's more like we just hang out and we tell stories, you know, and we do them every Friday. We just started it. We had Hailstorm on two weeks ago, and we had Theory of a Dead Man last Friday. Um, this week we have a band called Monster Truck. Where is that at? It's on. So it's live. It's live streamed uh, on YouTube. Okay. We need to get you. I'll message you after this is done, and we need to get you on a Friday because. Cool. We, yeah, the bank, we would love to have you on there and, and reminisce on old stuff. So, but yeah, yeah. you know, we'll we'll also try to figure out, you know, try to do some music stuff on there too. You know, we want to do something different from just a musical live stream. You know, break it down to more of a personal thing where we just talk to bands and tell stories <laughs> and yeah, yeah, make you know all that good stuff. Make fun of each other. It's fun. I love it's it. Fun. So That's awesome. I want to ask you, and I know, um, have you ever asked been asked about being on American Idol? <laughs> all the time <laughs> I'm teasing I'm teasing I'm te- we'll touch on that for. Uh, I want to touch on it for a second what was because I know you auditioned a few times for it yeah it was that that whole process was like a it was a fairly drawn out um, sort of saga you know like if you will like it, it was over the course of like three to four years I, I had a rip, the first time I auditioned was back in 2000 and 10, I think was a, was the first year and I made it up to a certain point. I didn't make it on the live shows. I made it to like the last week of, or the second to last day of Hollywood week and got cut or whatever. Yeah. And so, but the feedback was really good. So I, I went back the next year sure. and made it back, made it to the end of, it was like one step closer to the live shows and got cut again. But again, that all kind of, it all was like, because I was not prepared, like I was not comfortable, you know, really, truly and, and uh, completely comfortable as a performer on stage and just, right. you know, singing and being confident and like, you know, owning it and that kind of thing. I was still very much like kind of trying to find my footing, so to speak, just as an artist or whatever. And so did the two years, didn't make it. And then I took a year off and I had a band back home with, with Josh, uh, this it was just a local band, Elijah Hooker, and we did we cut a we did a record. We did like a locally produced record that we Sweet. did. Like we we did, we created like a band account kind of thing and did like a, a total grassroots um, sort of regional band thing. We did shows, dude. I remember one night, one time we drew we drove like five hours to Fayetteville, North Carolina, Sweet. and played like two people. It was crazy. <laughs> hey, just that's what you do, you know. Yeah, we got in a truck and like had a U-Haul and, and, and took the band out there and <clears throat> just remember all this like looking back on now, I just like super innocent, like naive, just like I had reached out to the Whiskey A Go Go, like sent an email because I was booking for the for the band and like they responded and I was like freaking out and like calling everybody, like thinking it was like the, the biggest, you know, just just but- super like rock and roll dream kind of kind of deal. And so. Those are the best times, though. Those are the best feelings. I know. Yeah, it's very innocent, you know, that kind of thing. And so did that for a year, did the record. We did some shows and all that stuff and got that kind of under my belt. And then I'll never forget this. It was actually my dad was was the guy that kind of, like, pushed me into going back and auditioning. We were were back in the backyard, and I don't even remember what we were doing, but he was just talking about, you know, hey, you know, Idol's coming uh, to Atlanta you know, it was like the summer, July or June or something like that. He's like, would you be interested in, in going? I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. I've got this band right now. I think I'm going to, you know, focus on that. And he like basically kind of said, hey, you know, you don't want to look back in life and have any regrets on, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda. You know, sure. this, this is a great opportunity. And he was like, you know, you've taken the time, you know, to do this band thing. And, and to be honest with you, the, the band stuff wasn't, I mean, it, we weren't really making like massive headway of like, you know, it was just like a local smokel do hickey band, whatever. And so, and actually the kind of the catalyst of that was that we had fired the drummer, the bass player. So we didn't have a band. It was like that kind of thing. There was like a a falling out with the, with the band. And so I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to go audition. So I went down um, to Atlanta and did it and just like sailed through the, producer rounds and they're like you know you're one of the best people we've seen you know 
all day and I was just yeah. like freaking out like holy cow like I've really you kind of see the fruits of your labor of just really busting Absolutely. your butt owning your craft and so then did the auditions for the judges and went through that sailed through Hollywood week and then made the live shows and then won the freaking thing so it's like you know yeah, it's just I get chills hearing that story uh, because here's why and uh, you know and I know you've answered questions about it and you talk about it a lot but I know it's still you're very thankful for it you know oh yeah uh, but you know, I get I chills. Be ta- I wouldn't be talking to you, you know, <laughs> well, if I had, but, you know. You know, I get chills hearing that because that 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 kind of success story is incredible, and I think it's a testament to you and and perseverance. Because uh, there's probably uh, peop- there's probably people out there that might have went one time and didn't make it, and like was like, well, that's it. I'm not good enough, you know. Yeah. So you I, I'm glad you didn't. Especially like in the, in this business, I think with any business in general, or just with career wise, you have to be determined. You have to have a vision. You have to, you have to have that tenacity. You have to have that, that fire, that passion in you, because that's what drives sure. the motivation. That's what drives your, the, the creative uh, vision that you have. And, and, you know, <clears throat> any like, like the, the idle stuff, like I'm sure a lot of people like, you know, passive, People would ever be like, oh, well, that was just handed to him. That was just whatever. That was definitely not handed to me. That was a that was a lot of work. That was that was years, years and years of preparation. Uh, yeah. You know. Uh, and you're on public display at that point. It's not like a band. It's like practicing in their basement for a couple friends, going, ah, oh, that kind of sucked, or oh, you're a little off key there, or the drummer was a little behind. You're no, on. You're kind of. Prime- yeah. You're doing this in public, you know, and it's like to the world. So it's yeah. you know, you don't you didn't have the luxury to kind of be a band in the basement, figuring it out, and then going out and playing one song great. You're everybody's watching you, and you know you get keyboard Let's, warriors and the, the prep leading up to that was what helped me. Was what when it was time to go, it was like I was ready. It was like I was ready to go. There was no second guessing or like oh i'm unsure about this it was like i know exactly what i'm doing i know exactly what song i'm gonna do i know exactly you know it was like it it was crazy man like i kind of had this and this is like not even to be funny but like it was like i the tiger like i had the the, the, the eye on the prize of like okay i know exactly what i want to do how i want to do it now this was on the show now the record after that that whole process was a completely different scenario something that i was not prepared for which i right. you know look back hindsight 2020 I, I wish that i would have been basically more firm in my uh belief and vision of what i wanted to do the record because just just a quick little story so after i won the show i was a huge fan of, of rival sons and this was kind of before they you know have kind of broken through now but they're still kind of like an under the radar band they had only put right. out like three records and I actually did fantastic band amazing band yeah uh i did one of their songs on the show it was the pressure in time and i was a fan of the producer that had produced that record dave cobb and dave cobb was like virtually unknown who's now went on to do chris stapleton and jason yeah. isbell and virgil simpson and every freaking you know right star born soundtrack he's done every freaking thing ever and i knew i knew that he was gonna be that guy like i i knew and i was like hey i was talking to the to the um the management team that was after that handles the idols or whatever, after the, the show, I was like, Hey, I was like, I really want to work with this guy. And they're like, no, 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 no. You're going to work with this guy who we we've already, you know, contracted to do this thing. And no, no personal offense to him, but he wasn't the guy that I wanted to do the record. I really wanted Dave Cobb to do the record. Right. And they just, I actually, I called Dave Cobb. I was like, Hey dude, we should do, he's like, yeah, we should do this. He's like, Hey, let's get rival sons and you together in the, in the studio and do a trap. I'm like, Fuck, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, and it, they wouldn't let me do it. They would not let me do it. And so because of all the contractual things, like people, maybe people don't understand this too. And, and you don't have to delve into it, but once you, oh, I people, can delve in. yeah. people might think he won American Idol and he, he's off, he's off to the races at this point and he can go and do, and he's got the world in the palm of his hand, which essentially in a way you do, but Some then, point, yeah. There's red tape, just like in in any in in the business. There's red tape behind that, which means, yeah, you want to go in the studio, you want to make this type of album, but hold on a second here, we still, you know, you're still contractually obligated because it yeah. was on American Idol. Yeah, 
So mm-hmm. that was kind of like the reality check of like having the rug like basically pulled out from under you because in the, the the reality of that whole situation was was those people and and I'm not talking about the the show. This is I'm t- I'm now talking about the business entity behind the show, which is the management company, 19 Entertainment and uh, Interscope Records, like that sort of like pairing. They just did not have my best interests in mind. They didn't really care. They were not supportive of me as a rock artist. They just didn't right didn't get it. They didn't understand how a kid singing White Snake Still the Night and One American Idol. Like it was just like this completely alien thing to them. And I'll never forget this, Ben. I was in this studio. I was in I was in Woodland Hills. I was I was making the record, or we were cutting the single, the the, the winner single, which was a terrible terrible song that was written by Justin Hawkins from the darkness who I, I'm a fan of. I love the, the darkness. Sure. I love Justin Hawkins, but this song was like, it was a piece of crap. It was like, <laughs> like it was that bad. And I took the lyrics to the, to the A&R guy for Interscope records. And I was like, uh, I, I, like the lyrics on it was like cracking eggs to make omelets. Like, uh, you don't have to wear the same track suits. Like this is the lyrical content in the song. Like this, right. this is, and I, I hand it to the guy. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, John. I'm like, do you think this is a good song? I was like, you think this is a, a hit song? And he looked me dead in the eyes. He was like, Caleb, nobody writes rock songs anymore. So he said to me right there in in the process of recording the song. And I'm just like, your heart kind of sinks, right? Yeah, you're just like, what was the point of doing this? You know. But looking back on that, it was a great learning experience for me just to see that you don't have to have all that crap. Mm-mm. Do, to do to do your stuff, you just have to have money. But <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh, kicker. That's, yeah, the... <laughs> that's, the, that's the kicker. But but that but that was a really great eye opening experience for me. Where it's like, if you want to make a rock and roll record, go make your own damn rock and roll record. You don't have Absolutely. to get signed to a label. You don't have to do all this crap that was, you know, supposedly that was the way to do it. You know, yeah. in years past and. and you can do. You definitely can can work if if the label is supporting you and like supports your vision and is like there with you as a teammate, like 110 percent. Then hell yeah. But yeah. if not, the only person that's going to really champion and believe in, in what you're doing is is you. So you have. Yeah. So what I took from that was that really, in but in some rare cases, the only person that's in your corner is you. So you have to like step up for yourself. You know, put your foot down, and that's what I didn't do during that process i was very much like everything was going really fast and like i was like you know pulled this way to do this and this and that and, and then the end result was not was not me to right. a degree there some great little moments on that first record but for the most part man they just shoved my voice through auto-tune and tried to do like a pop thing and it was not yeah it was well it was crazy but made it out on the other side of that alive and and, and well so it's all good but it was definitely a crazy you know, that whole year was a crazy whirlwind of experiences. I mean, we were, I was like flying from, so we did, so I won the show. I did a bunch of press. I flew to, to New York and it was like going to Florida. I was doing something for Disney and like came back and then literally started the record like a week after the show was done. So we had like, we had three weeks to do the record. We had nothing. We had, right. they were sending me these demos and stuff like that. And I'm like, let's just try to do, to write the record. And so we did like a week of just writing sessions where I would try to like write like two songs a day. We would have different writers coming in like Blair. Yeah. I love that guy. Brian Howes. Uh, uh, you know, James Michael. Yeah. We wrote a song with James Michael for our third album. Yeah. Six, eight, six a.m. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Great singer. Killer songwriter too. He's really, yeah. Really His cool. energy is insane too. Like that was what infectious writing with him. Like, you know, even if you were writing that player, Nashville in Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. So he had just back to LA. So we were at we were up in Eagle Rock with gotcha. him, and, and um, it was just it was just so fast, dude. And they uh, we did the week to write the record. The next week we recorded at NRG Studios, but it was just so disconnected. The whole process was crazy, and then I had to fly out to start the American Idol tour, and flew. Um, to Binghamton, New York, to start rehearsals for the Idol tour. We flew to New York to Binghamton. We did the rehearsals, did the first show. Literally, got in a car 
and was driven to JFK Airport and flown on a red eye back to LA to cut another song. And this is crazy. I don't even remember this 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 happening, but I was backstage at a, at a Shinedown show and Brent Smith was like, hey, do you remember me coming up talking to you at Howard Benson's house in Calabasas? And he, I was like, what? I was like, I don't even remember that. He was like, yeah, you were passed out in his room on the couch because I literally was driven straight to his house and passed out on the uh, and passed out on the couch and apparently was there because I was exhausted. You know what I'm saying? Just the ping pong and back and forth and like the trap. Then, then flew straight back out. Was doing the uh, the rest of the tour and then was flying back to LA to do it. it dude, it was just such a crazy surreal experience is like you can't i mean i've got tons of stories i mean i can tell you all right. kinds of crazy stuff that, that we were doing but it was just like it literally sounds like out of was, a movie it did it, it honestly dude in certain moments it totally was like that like it was like you know especially like being plucked out of like you know like Asheville is kind of like a little hot town now but Asheville then was kind of virtually under the radar and it was like nowheresville put up at the sunset marquee which is like where all the yeah. rock stars and i mean i would see billy gibbons like in the in the whiskey bar drinking and like bono coming around the corner out of his That's villa insane. like door to mine and then another cool story was that we were there i was there and kings of leon was staying there and they were uh they were fans of mine because their mom was watching the show and they're like hey you need to check this guy he's gonna be like on tour with you yeah. guys ever and so um nathan uh, the drummer came to me and he was like, he's like, Hey Kim, what's up, dude? He's like, you know, we're fans or whatever. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> That's awesome, man. And he was like, Hey, you want to come to our show at the forum, uh, this weekend? I'm like, yeah, dude. So got to go backstage the Kings of Leon show and hang out with the drummer for muse. And just like, just all this crazy, like yeah, stuff that you can't like as a fan of music and like bands, like you're just like, kid in the candy store you can't even like comprehend that you're now in the presence of these people that are now like your peers basically and you're just kind of like you know it's just you're just in awe of like anything because right. I'm I, listen first and foremost you know, I'm a fan of of music of rock music I mean sure. just about any kind of music and so it's the same thing with you guys just getting a tour with you guys you're just in awe because you see these people I mean crushing it on stage and it's it's an inspiring thing to see that because it inspires you uh, as a as a performer and as an artist to just start strive every day to be just as kick ass as as the always, as the that you look up to you know and I've always said like if you're in a band or an artist or a performer or whatever or even not even just music any form of artist if you can't get inspired by somebody else whether they're get new out. yeah like yeah. you know then there's something wrong there you know yeah. I can watch a brand new band that just came out. Uh, you know, and, and some people go, well, we've been around longer, so there's a rule where we can't be inspired by a 16-year-old bunch of kids who just put, you know, that's that's completely false. Like, that's exactly I can, sometimes that's a reality check, and you go, hey, you know, you, we feel like, oh, you put out six albums, you know, we're in our 30s, which is not old at all, but, you know, then you watch this other band, and you're like, okay, time to step it up a little bit, because that's the new group of bands. Toes, yeah, yeah. But yeah. the thing so it was like with you guys as a as a band Black Sun Cherry, you guys have set the groundwork for bands after that. You know what I'm saying? Like there's always those like you're setting the standard for like what's a great album or what's a great song, what's a great rock band, what's a great, you know what I'm saying? Like that, it's yeah. a great thing. The same thing I was t telling the Rival Sons guys, I was like, you know, you guys are setting the standards of like the bands that are to come after you. Like there's like those certain band like the bands set the standards or they set the stage for what's to come next you know sure. same same thing with like the jack white and the white stripes and the uh black keys kind of thing they set the standard for what was to come after that it was like all this stuff so you have all this amazing uh evo the evolution of like rock bands and rock music and rock and roll music or heavy metal whatever it's really cool to see that progression you know, throughout the years of just, you know, the, that evolution of that music. It's crazy. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And you're, and you're doing great too with your stuff. I wanted to come to that. Ram no, I, I suck, dude. Here, let me get no. it up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, once this is over with, you may give you some vocal lessons, pal. Yeah. Yeah. I need some. Yeah. My yeah. mom, my mom says I'm a good singer. So 
damn right, dude. I've got I've got that going for me. I, uh, uh. <laughs> I, <hoo> <laughs> I'm going to audition for American Auto right now. I'm gonna say, hey, Caleb told me I could do it. You know. You uh, I'm wearing hey, this hat if I can though. Win it, you can win it, dude. They're, they ain't taking this hat off me when I get there, though. You know, no, it's it's pack part. it's package deal. Yeah, uh, buddy. Ramblin' Saints, your album that came out, it was a badass album, and you had some like incredible musicians on this album too. Yeah, that record um, was such a blast, man. It was so much fun to, like I said before, it was like the 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 um, the comparison to the first record with that is like night and day because it's like a completely different vibe. It's you, know you and saying? your element. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. And it was exactly the record that I, excuse me, wanted to make the first go around, but wasn't able to, to do that. And so it was literally like we, we set up at Zach Brown studio, Southern ground Nashville, Sweet. which unfortunately now they're like selling that thing for, Ten million dollars, which that studio was really. I didn't know they were selling it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on with with the Zach Brown camp. I don't know why they. That's dude. That's I don't know if you've ever been in that studio, but that studio is amazing. I see pictures chef, of it every day have, on Instagram, and yeah, they have a they have a chef downstairs that cooks yeah. meals for you. Like you don't have to leave. It's all like super homegrown, in house. And, I, and I, I think the Blackberry Smoke guys have recorded there. Well, wow. uh, quite a bit, but it was just such a blast, man. And we did it cut it live on the floor uh um you know th those performances are live performances and did have some killer players that was, had oddly freed who was yeah. in black crows and um insane guitar player killer guitar player uh fred eltringham and tony lucido and uh, mike webb who played on chris stapleton's i think his first and second record and a bunch of other stuff but the guy that that produced that record that that set me up was my cousin brian sutton who's like a three-time grammy winning bluegrass guitar player who's like seriously if you get a chance go check him out he's like one of the top notch like acoustic players in the world and he's in the session player world like in nashville he's like the a-list like top tier guy the first call guy that he gets on he's played on probably just about every hit country record that's come out of nashville you know in the past Sweet. 10 15 years so he kind of was like the kind of facilitator that set all that up for me and then kind of just was like dude just be you just go in and yeah. sing your face off he's like that's all you got to do and so literally set the mics up got everybody in the room and then we just cut it and then brought the bgvs in um later that night and did the background vocals later in the day but it was just a super fun i mean i i wish i could be in that room doing that every day all day for the rest right. of my life you know what i'm know. saying it, it was that it was that fun and so it was a real bummer because I was, I just called him like two days ago. I was like, Hey man, let's go back in the studio and do, I was thinking about cutting like, just like two covers. Like I was thinking about doing rare earths celebrate. Yeah. And, um, drift away the Doby gray. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there's a killer Tina Turner version. That's like more like a little bit more like aggressive. But I was thinking it'd be cool. As, what if it, the black crows had cut drift away? How would that sound? And so I was like, we should do that. I like that. that version of that kind of song you know with the bgvs and big guitars and, and whatever so that was kind of my idea to go in and do that but they shut the damn studio down to sell it yeah. so it's had to find a, a new studio but um it was a blast man and i'm really proud of that record it's some of the best reviews i've ever gotten yeah. in my career you know and so i just hope to continue to keep making records like that and and you know tour it and support it and, and whatever but it's crazy man i was like financially and also just like from a creative standpoint doing it on your own is like the way to do it unless you have, unless you have a team that's like really like gung-ho and supportive and like hey you know we we're back in this 110 percent. we're going to give you all the, the firepower we have in, in our tank then that's great but if you don't have that I'll, you can just as easily uh, facilitate radio promotion and yep. uh, well, PR. I think, th I think that's the way it's going now. And that you know, honest, honestly, we're with Mascot, but it's a it's a license deal through Mascot. You know, and we said we we're, we're good to sign with the label because we thought it was a cool label. They had some cool artists, um, but we yeah. said we we want creative control. Like we don't want to be because we were like you. 
you know, making we we've all made albums that we look back and go, we just didn't feel like we had maybe enough hands on. You know what I mean? Not that yeah. we're not that uh, you know. I think it's just because you're young and you're naive and you don't know yet. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's all you, you learn right. every every time you make an album, you learn something. You learn Absolutely. something different every single time, and and that's. That's the beauty of, of being an artist or whatever, because you, you're growing with your art. So it's like every everything, like whether it's an album or a movie or a painting, whatever, you grow progressively each time, you know, yeah. unless you're M. Night Shyamalan, dude, because you just hit that peak of that one movie and then hey. the rest, of it, man, I'm kidding. I'm, I, I, we're going to end on horror movies. Don't talk, kill by the way. M. <laughs> I love M. Night. Um, yeah. that's what we do that's what we've been our our last albums we've self-produced them on our own and uh, we recorded okay. it at uh, at John our bass you know John our bass player he b- built a studio um, in the middle of nowhere in the woods and it's incredible Wait, built the studio our bass player John oh, okay yeah and uh, any, when this is when you're when we're able to cross the street again you should come and uh, and check it out because we did our second blues EP there and we just did the new album there and it's incredible that's he um uh, he really didn't spare any expenses with the way he constructed it. Of course, John loves like uh, uh construction and architecture, so he's got yeah. the room built for sound and the weird things coming out of the walls and you know what I mean. Uh, Do you guys you guys built your own studio? You guys have your own mm-hmm. compound. You're like yeah. The BSC uh uh the hut. Shangri La. Yeah. <laughs> the Shangri La, if you will, exactly. Yes. That's crazy, man. It's cool. You have to come down uh, and, and yeah. check that so out. Who engineers it? Do you guys engineer it? Do you guys have a mixer? Or who, so who does all There is another guy that is, is partners with John that is the house engineer. But um, we had him. His name's Mark. And we had Mark and then a guy named Jordan Westfall that tours with us as our monitor engineer, who is yeah. like one of the smartest dudes as far as recording and, and audio stuff that I've ever met in my life. He came down and he engineered it. And he is actually mixing it too, and he's doing a great job. And he's got one more song to mix, and it goes to mastering. But uh, it was fun, and it, we always tell young bands that too, or any bands like, hey, you don't, ha- you know, a lot, a lot of people have the stereotype of thinking they need it to be like the movies. It has to be like everything. You're riding around in limos, and you get dudes in suits smoking cigars, giving. It's like, man, that's not the way. Like you can make an album in your basement right now that could go on. Look at uh, uh, uh what's her name, uh, uh Billie Eilish, right? They did in the bedroom or something, yeah. I mean, come on, you know. Or look at Sergio Simpson, you know, who, you know, did it on his own. All of a sudden, people start noticing. They're like, oh, this is great, you know. Yeah, talent, dude, talent finds or gets recognized one way or another. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. There's no no way of getting around it. I mean, if you're good, people are going to talk about it, and they're going to – it's just going to naturally progress where you're going to get an audience. Right. Basically cultivating your audience is what it is. I was talking to Richie Cotson about this. I did a, a sh- short run with the Winery Dogs last year. And crazy band. I don't know if you're familiar with, with the Winery Dogs, but it's yeah. Mike Portnoy, Billy Sheehan, and Richie Cotson. And we good, were just talking. Good players. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was just talking about his – he was on Interscope and just talking about that whole major label fiasco stuff. And, like, he was like – he's like, basically, man, he was like, you got to have your vision and you got to cultivate your audience. That's basically what it comes down to. And that's just yeah. kind of what the main goal is that you just have to focus on your music and make it as honest and pure and kick ass as possible. And then you build it, they will come. You know, that's kind of the. The cream the, always rises. You know what I mean? If you do something that is not genuine, and you know, no matter how good you are, but if you do it and it's not genuine, people know that. And they're like, yeah. I'm not oh, yeah. buying it. Oh, that. Not stuff from a mile away. And that was yeah. the thing with my first album. That, a lot of the fans that had invested it in their time and energy, like voting for me or whatever, they were really let down because of that record, because it wasn't a really truthful representation of what they saw on the show. I mean, it was, on the show, it was me singing live rock and roll. There was like no way of getting well. Yeah. And it weird thing. It was like, I remember we had this discussion with, with Howard at the studio and he was just kind of like, he was like, why do we, why do we need to change it? Why do we need to, why do we need to, why do we need to change it? He didn't, he didn't change on the show. He was like, people right. voted who he was. And so it was just, it was really weird, man. Yeah. So you always uh, get people that have different ideas of what you need to be. And that that's where it gets weird, you know? Yeah. I think kiss my ass, but you know, I it's like, you. that's the thing. But, um, you're but doing, I mean, I you, you're, you're one of the best and that's why people come to you 
and and that's why you have not only gone for American Idol, had your own albums out, Trans Siberian Orchestra. I mean, come on, Meatloaf. I mean, come on, dude. Like that's incredible stuff. Like yeah. so, right right now, I know the world doesn't know what's happening, but it, and normally, it, if you were gonna do a TSO tour, when does that start? Like, when do you all start? When would you rehearse for that? Because it starts what? Oct- that start October, November. Yeah. So the way that works is is it's um, they. I think they start like the second to last week of October, or maybe it's like the, the two week. We we do like two weeks of rehearsals in October, all the way up until like the second week of November. And then the the way it works, and, and and I'm a huge fan, and like with the Meatloaf stuff and the and the TSO stuff. So my favorite man of all time is Queen. I love that theatrical sure. uh bombastic rock music now my heart is like southern rock you know gospel you know all right that's where my my juju is but i love the the theatrical the over uh, the top over the top big the top. you know i love i love meat love bad hell is one of my favorite records of all time and, and the story behind that record is really cool too but um but the tso stuff is is this guy paul o'neill who was a, a rock man. He was like Lieber and Krebs back in the day. He like was managing Aerosmith and uh, Joan Jett and yeah. like, I think maybe Def Leppard or something like, maybe for a hot minute or something to that effect. But he had this vision. So he was, so he was, he was produced in this band called Sabotage, which was like this eighties kind of progressive metal. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Hall of the Mountain King, like uh-uh. super fantastical, like, uh, um, very theatrical like power metal like super uh like over the top like i'll send you some stuff of of theirs just really interesting stuff but they had this they had this song the the sarajevo 1224 the the on one of their metal records and it became a hit and the the, paul o'neill was like dude we need to craft a show around this song and so that's what spawned trans Siberian orchestra and so He, the, he had the Paul O'Neill. He had this like sort of vision of doing like this Christmas rock opera, and he had written this like whole story like around about this angel coming down to earth and like all this crazy stuff like witnessing the world and what the joy of Christmas like. It was it's like just thinking about it, it's like it's so brilliant. Yeah, this guy with this idea, and it, and he was like wanting to craft this massive show around that one song, and so he basically wrote this entire rock opera around Christmas. And so it was like this super unique um, and really, really smart thing because nobody else. Nobody's done that. And so here they are 21 years later. Dude, they sell out arenas twice a day. Like they do matinee. That, pro- that production is insane. Yeah. It's like a kiss show. It's like, well, even, even grander than a kiss show. It's like, it's like a, it's like watching like a rock Broadway show. Yeah. Like they have huge set pieces. They have, most of the songs are like character based. So they're characters. So you have to like, kind of like act and like do all this right. this stuff. And, um, uh, but it's like this, it's like watching like a, a, a Broadway rock show. It's like, it's like a rock opera basically. And so yeah. they have a storyteller in the show that does like these little like monologues. Like in a between. narration. Yeah. Narration. Yeah. To narrate the story or whatever. And, it's like this huge. So what the, the way the show's worked set up is that the first half is always the rock opera. They, he, I think he, he wrote like three rock operas. So there's like three Christmas rock operas, and then the back half is like all kinds of stuff. It's like Mozart, like that kind of deal, or they do yeah. sabotage stuff. They do all kinds of. They've, they've done covers in the past, but it's like this huge. It's like a two, almost three hour show. It's like it's, it's big. Hours. It's big. And. Um, Tons of effects, tons of pyro and all this stuff. And uh, they, uh, the guy that, the Paul O'Neill guy, he was heavily influenced by Meatloaf, like the Bad Out of Hell record, because that record in itself is a rock opera that was written by Jim Steinman, who was like yeah. huge world class songwriter that wrote Total Eclipse of the Heart and uh, Making Love Out of Nothing at All. It's all coming back to me now, like a really big, beautiful, big like big, songs. big power ballad kind of theatrical rock songs. And so, he was really heavily heavily influenced by Meatloaf and Jim Steinman, and so that's kind of where that inspiration came from—the the Christmas rock operas for Trans Siberian Orchestra. And now TSO is like, I think it's like one of the top three biggest touring acts in the world. They do, has to be. 
they, I, I kid you not, dude, they, we would play to like 40,000 people in one day. Like, it's like, it's crazy. I mean. And there's two, there's two groups, right? Is there's two. Right? Yeah, they do. They, they're actually, um, I don't even know if I can say this right now, but I, I, I no, I can't even say it. Cause they'll don't, probably don't kill Don't say it. Don't say it. Yeah. But, uh, but they, um, yeah, they got two groups. So the way the rehearsals work is they, they rent out the arena in Omaha, the, um, whatever the arena is called in Omaha, Nebraska. And both bands are set up on either sides of the arena. So you have the West Coast band on one side and the East Coast band on the other. Full stage production, everything, and you run through the show simultaneously. So while one band is on stage rehearsing, the other band's in the, in the uh, what do you call it? Uh, not dressing room, uh, locker room. Gotcha. Rehearsing with the band. So they have a small little studio set up for the yeah. band and rehearsal space. And it's just simultaneously going back and forth. So it's like this gargantuan production and they've got it down to a T. And then once that's done, the band, the, the East band, which is the band that I'm on flies to green Bay, Wisconsin. And we start the, the tour. So the whole band, the production, everything is all on one plane. And we go to green Bay and start wow. the tour. And it's like a freaking freight train, dude. It's like when that stuff starts rolling, dude, it's like, we go all the way to the end of December. Like, yeah. Last year was like last show was Toronto, Canada, and then flew straight home. And then I had a New Year's Eve show. I flew from Toronto, Canada, got up at four a.m., flew from Toronto, Canada to Raleigh, North Carolina, and did a New Year's Eve show uh, downtown Raleigh. Like I was like fried. I was like, I can't imagine. Like, is, it, <laughs> is it weird too? Because I'm like, a, when it comes to like certain holidays, especially Christmas, I, I'm a homebody. You know, because we have, we have family yeah. traditions. Is it was it weird? Because you know, with that that business it has to cater to that. I mean, you might be playing Christmas Eve or the day before Christmas Eve and then the day after. So is it weird kind of being on the road, like right there in the middle of that holiday that, you know, you know, you're used to the family stuff. You're used to the, like that kind of, the, yeah. I, I, dude, who doesn't love Christmas? Who doesn't exactly. love exactly Christmas, their family? Am I getting too close to the camera? I'm like, who doesn't love Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> Take me seriously. <laughs> yeah. 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 But like, but but we miss Thanksgiving and Christmas. Like with if you're thinking like missing it, like missing it with family, like yeah. that kind of thing. But they do. We do like Christmas parties. We do the, the Thanksgiving parties, and, and it's you know it it's it's something that, like with what I do is like when I come back off the road, I do Christmas right Thanksgiving with my with my you family. You kind of have to adjust. I mean, we've missed several Thanksgivings too. You know, we we make it mandatory never to miss Christmas just because you know three of the other guys have kids too and. You know. Oh yeah, it, it, let, let me tell you, it, I, I I don't have kids. You know, I'm not I'm not married, so I, I don't have that that sort of uh, responsibility right now. And so right. you see, but definitely like some of the guys in the band that do have kids, they do have families, and, and it definitely is tough in the sense that they do. I mean, obviously they're going to miss their family, so they do a lot right. of FaceTime. They do sometimes the families will come out on the road; they'll come to the hotels or whatever, and and yeah. and get time with them, but. It's it's weird because it's it's that that show is so unique because the, when everybody else is like shutting down, they're like thriving, dude. They're, yeah, they're like thriving. killing it, and it. But it's 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 really inspiring because this this first of all, this guy had the vision. He had the he had the, the vision of this show and what it was, what he saw it could be, and obviously now it has become that. But yeah, um. It's it's an arena rock show, but I mean it's around Christmas. But they're like one of the few rock bands that go out and sell out arenas. Like they sure. do, I mean, up sell out shows. When I saw them, I saw them in two thousand eight or nine, and uh, Alex Skolnick was playing guitar for them at that time yep. too. I mean these are metal dudes, but here's why it's cool because you get like metal heads or like rock fans anyway that want to go see and if you if if they buy a ticket to the show they're gonna see like a full on rock show yeah then you got like the moms and the grandmas that might not be into like heavy metal or rock but they love these Christmas songs and it's just it's rock enough to it's not over their head you know what I mean but it's like they can they might tap their foot a little harder to it you know so it's it's a genius concept it's genius yeah the guy was like yeah. brilliant and so um what if Rob Zombie and TSO did a just a Halloween Christmas tour together, because you know Zombies got the Halloween theme down pretty good. I think I think they, I think we should uh, make this try to happen. I'm gonna sign a sheet up, get everybody to go. Rob That's Zombie, crazy. 
co-headline with trans Siberian Orchestra. Meet the- that creeper. <laughs> meet that creeper. It's the Halloween Christmas <laughs> tour. <laughs> <laughs> you get best of both worlds. Oh, I know. You get the best. Of- you know that song? Oh, dude. Bam. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I lo- love Sammy Hagar. He's one of my favorites. Yeah. All right. Amazing. I- I've kept That'd you long great. enough. Hey, you know, hey, speaking of Rob Zombie, I'm uh, I'm disappointed in his new movie that he came out with last year. I didn't. Free I didn't, from hell. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. You know what? I, the last good movie. I and a lot of people don't like this movie that he made, but I really enjoyed Lords of Salem. That movie about it the was, witches. It was. Uh, I liked it too for the simple fact that it was off the beaten path for what he had norm- normally do. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of like the it was kind of like eerie like the shining and just like bizarre like it made you feel uncomfortable like mentally versus yeah. just seeing like blood and and guts and you know yeah or yeah yeah, yeah. I, I like think that the movie last, the last of that one and then I like the Halloween the, the remake the uh, I did too I love the Halloweens but see the thing I like about but obviously my favorite movie of his is Devil's Rejects but the but I love how he incorporates seventies rock music in his yeah movie like he has a full on like Days and Confused soundtrack, like in all of his I mean, movies. When would you ever think you would hear Freebird on top of like a full on shootout between that's, murderers and police? That's a great scene, and he should have just left it like that because I, I that movie I didn't like that movie. I didn't like uh, what was the one he did? It was like Clowns or something like Thirty One. Oh, thirty One. I th- now Thirty One was pretty. It was pretty dark. <laughs> You like that? I, I, I think so. I think I did. I remember. I remember watching it, being like, "God, we know what that movie was to me was total. It was that was fan service. I think he had done Lords of Salem, and a lot of people were like, "Oh, come on, this isn't House of Thousand Corpses. You know, we want another something like that." And I think yeah. he was just like, "All right, screw it. I'm going to write a script, and I'm going to put as much weird gore into this, and then I'll make my fans happy." You know. See, I don't even remember. I don't even remember. Uh, the, a scene from that movie. I just remember the. Uh, I don't even remember. I just remember them in the you van. You've never like, seen it. You're lying. You've never seen. I it. did. Yeah, they were in the <laughs> van. They get they get stopped at the thing and they, yeah. they, get, they get ripped out of the the van and they get put in that like basement thing or whatever. There's yeah. like the main clown guy that uh, uh, and there's like this like weird like circle of like British people or something wearing yeah. wigs. Something I Malcolm, see. Uh, Malcolm McDowell is one of those. Is one of the guys. Yeah, that's yeah. it's cool. He puts all those old horror actors in the yeah. uh, in his movies, which I think is cool because uh, you like me, like we love. I love that crap. I love sure. the old, and I love that you love Creature from the Black Lagoon because that's like my favorite, one of my favorite movies. It's like top five. I thought about that, and I have a little statue. I don't want to leave and go get it, but it, I was gonna put him right here. Oh, you? Hold on, hold on. I got some. Hold on, hold on. All right. We love horror movies. Caleb and I, uh, we talked about this a lot on the road, that uh, um, we love the universal horror movies, the uh, the Halloweens, of course. And then we get into some obscure stuff. When he comes back, I need to ask him. He sent me some weird, bizarre movies one time that I needed to watch. Um, some stuff that I'd never even heard of before, but Caleb knew about it. Look at that. And that's good. Reaction, man. I'm so happy for them. There it is. There it is. Look at that beautiful poster. You need to get that in a frame right now. I am, dude, I have a bunch of, uh, of uh, horror movie, like 50s, like science fiction uh, uh, things. Hey, you, hey let, me, let me tell you this. So, I, uh, so since we have like downtime, we're not doing anything. I, yeah. I've been making uh, stop motion monster movies. I'll, send, I'll, I'll send you a picture of it. Let me, let me find these little. Uh, I did that when I was growing up too. I would take action figures and take a, a VHS camcorder and like move them and stop record and then move their leg and then record, stop record. And you played it back. And if you got like five seconds of like solid motion, I was the happiest ever. Yeah, it was like four hours. Yeah, you have to do it. It's like a long. <laughs> Look at this. So I made this little thing, this little critter. Like, oh, it's awesome. A little Here. thing to collect. I dig that. It's kind of a Stranger Things ish. Yeah, and then this little thing, this little. I like it, man. You should start uh, making your own little toy line. <laughs> no, no. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. This, this little critter. I need to send you some pictures of my stuff too, then, and we can start geeking out about all this. Yeah, I love it. Good but, for you. That's cool. Yeah, but I'll, I'll send you the video 
Uh, yeah, please do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna post. I'm gonna post it online immediately as soon as I get it. By the way. Hell yeah, you totally should. I'm gonna, but... I'm gonna charge for it. <laughs> charge <laughs> like oh yeah, but uh, but they but but yeah, he just yeah. And listen, I'm a fan of his music, and and obviously the music videos he's done, and I, I also love Marilyn Manson's videos. But some of the some of his movies are kind of just super representative of uh, his music videos. You know what I'm right. saying? Like especially House of a Thousand Corpses. That's like a Rob Zombie music video. Like, Absolutely. Completely, but hey, the guy—he's a genius too, man. You know. Hey, have you guys ever thought about doing a horror movie? I would love to do a horror movie. We've talked about it all the time um, about filming one. Maybe we should do it now because we used to say, "Oh, we get some time," you know, because we were always on tour. Yeah, but now it would be cool. I have some cool ideas for horror movies, but I can't—I don't want to say them here because somebody's going to take it and run with it. I know, so dude. I'll have, yeah. I'll have to text you my weird ideas, and then we're gonna write this script and put it out. You know, the, there's this cool, the follow, quarantine I follow, killer. I follow John Carpenter on Instagram, and I saw this really kick-ass post that he put about. He showed this picture of a stack of his old movie scripts that he had written. Saw like, that. And uh, uh, Christine, all this stuff, and he was like, "Now's the time to write your uh, sure movie script or whatever." And I'm like, Hell "John yeah. Carpenter, a genius." Genius. Dude, I, so the Creature from the Black Lagoon is one of my favorites. Also, my other favorite is The Thing. I love the that was eighties The Thing. Yes. You ever seen? Oh, dude, Carpenter, Carpenter. is Carpenter's one of my favorites, and he went to uh, you know the the a little tidbit the score for Halloween. You know, he composed that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, that was done, of course. And there's several that was done by the Bowling Green Symphony Orchestra, which Bowling Green, Kentucky, is like thirty minutes from here. Yeah. And uh, that's where, so in Halloween, he talks about Smith's Grove, uh, the sanitarium is in Smith's Grove, which yeah. is, that's where you have to pass through to get to Bowling Green. Uh, Smith's Grove is 20 minutes from here, probably. And then uh, Warren County, they mentioned Warren County, which is where, so he, I think he went to, John Carpenter apparently went to Western Kentucky University, um, which is the college, uh, the nearest co- yeah. college to us. So there's lots of cool, like, local shout outs he's done in his, t- in Halloween yeah. to, yeah. I love that. Yeah, he's he's probably one of the pioneers of like the slasher movies because oh. Halloween yeah. was that was the one I think easily. Halloween maybe, was what well, was, was first the of its first, time. Did, did, did that come out or was Friday the Thirteenth? Was that did that no, come fr- out? Friday was after. So he was like the OG. He was like he was, the original. he was the OG of like the the young kids. You know the getting cut up. Yeah, getting cut up. The babysitter, the 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 guy that stalks, and he was like that was first of its time. That's great. Did you see the the uh, the most recent Halloween? Loved it. Yeah, it was good. I liked Loved it. it. And he did the score for that. I got it on vinyl. I listened to it. You know, some people might think that's weird, but I'll put that on and just listen to the the scores, the soundtrack to that because I think it's fantastic. The stuff he did, and he's still out there composing and producing. Yeah. I love it. You know, there's supposed to be two more of those coming. You know. Yeah, I saw Halloween Kills or something like that. Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends, and then Halloween Ends again, and then. Halloween yeah. Halloween was joking. He's back. <laughs> I know. They just keep... Hey, you know what, though? If it's good, it doesn't matter. That's you my thing. I mean? Here's the thing. Uh, it's I'm a franchise go- deal. And yes. the only one I never liked was the Leprechaun, so I never liked that crap. That was like... You mean on the Halloween series? No, no. I'm oh, talking the movie about like, Leprechaun. Things like Slasher, like those people oh, yeah. that have like six or seven movies like the Leprechaun. I never... I never got into Leprechaun. Yeah, I never never dug that. But I never got into Child's Play either because I'm like, yeah, me, I didn't. You, yeah, that was, you just yeah. kick him, kick him over, like put him in the trash, and it's done. Yeah, I that that he, Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger and um, Texas Chainsaw is one of my favorites too. Texas Chainsaw, you know, I actually like the second the there's a one with Dennis Hopper that's like the sequel to that. Yes, Texas, I like that. that he's like he's fun. he's the sheriff, right? Yeah, with the t- with the two chainsaws. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> That's awesome. I saw that. that one's cool. That one's more kind of like cartoony, like campy, uh, yeah. not as gritty, like dark as that that the first, first one. one. Man, was that first one was bizarre. Yeah, then oh. you had the one that had Matthew McConaughey in the in it. Remember that one? I didn't see that, but I, oh. that's the, that's the, that's got that cool uh, cover with the chainsaw with the lipstick, isn't it? Yeah. Like the, Matthew yeah. McConaughey, and I think it's maybe I want to say Renee Renee Zellweger. I can't remember. But McConaughey's in it, and that was that was when they were starting to get like, you know, I don't know what what they were thinking about making those, but yeah, they just like fall off the wagon. But um, 
I do hope, like, because the, the 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 most recent Halloween was really really good, so I hope they continue to like, yeah, stay on path. Because, like you said, like those last like Halloween four. I, I wait. I think the Halloween four was pretty good. The Halloween four was good. Number three, they got a little weird because that's with they, the mask. Yeah, it's the mask. They that tried wasn't even part of the story. Yeah, that was, they tried to change the formula, and then they were like, "No, let's go back." Because they were trying to make it like an anthology thing of right. like like Halloween. Halloween could be anything that happens on Halloween. It's like, no, we want Michael Myers. That's it. Yeah. You know, if that had been its own movie, it'd have been good. good. If you just looked at it as like a standalone movie, that was a pretty good movie. That's what I'm saying. And I think the the producer said that they said if we had just made this its own thing, it could have been a really big cult movie, probably. But because yeah. it's in the Halloween franchise, you know, people it are like, popped, yeah, yeah, get out of here. Yeah, did you, speaking of like Halloween anthology, did you see that movie Trick or Treat? That's what the uh, like the principal or something at one point, right? Doesn't he? And he gives the kid candy, like vomit. Yeah. Blood. yeah. God, yeah. That, that's weird. It's that's kind of campy too, though, right? Because I started watching and I was like, that's that's odd. Then this weird stuff starts happening. I'm like, what is this movie? Oh, he you has, right. the, he has the sucker, and you know, it's like, yeah. I don't but know. That's, I you didn't watch. You didn't watch the whole movie. I don't think I did. No, I need to go back oh. and watch it again. It's good. It's, All right. It's, that's one of the better like movies that's come out in the past like five, six, seven years. But um, speaking of like newer horror movies, did you see Hereditary or Midsommar or any of those movies? Okay, Hereditary freaked me out. And yeah, I saw, yeah. I saw. I call it Midsummer. I, I saw that in Europe, so I was. It was. I was already in a weird straight frame of mind anyway, because we're on tour. We're in Europe. We go to the yeah. small theater. Nobody speaks English. I'm like, oh, we found the movie. It was playing in English. And yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, this is, I don't know what Crazy. to think about it. That that movie goes home with you. It really does, you know? Craziest scene in that movie that I, that I remember, like, I was like, God, like, I'm getting chills now just talking about yeah. it was when he is driving in the car with the with the with his sister in the back, and she's, like, having an allergic reaction. Yeah. And she, like, sticks her head out and then goes, Damn. Oh. Then it follows him up into his room and he just lays down and you hear his mom <laughs> get out of bed. That's and so she cool. goes outside and she just starts screaming and you're just like, oh my gosh, yeah. dude. Crazy. The guy that directed that is great because he did well, Midsommar. Have you yes. seen Midsommar? Yes, that's what I was talking about. That's, that's the one we saw in Europe. Midsommar? Yes. Oh, so you didn't see Hereditary? No, I, we saw Hereditary too. Oh. Hereditary. Yeah, Hereditary or Midsommar, yeah, that one's crazy too. With the, the, with the, guy the bear suit? Oh yeah, the bear suit. Yeah, they burn them alive. Yeah, the, dude, yeah. the bear suit. But the the good thing about the thing about Hereditary, the genius marketing behind that, and I don't want to give us away if you may hasn't seen it, but it you should go see it. The little girl, you know, she's in all the posters, she's in all the previews. You think, you know, well, she's going to be the main player Focus. here. That is genius how they they built that up, and then that scene, and you're like, I, I was like, I, me and my you wife watched it. Yeah. I was like stunned, and I'm like, "That is good filmmaking." You know that that's what you want from a, a horror movie is to be like totally shocked. Yeah, and it's like a creepy devil cult and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, weird. Yeah, and the dude he he goes upstairs and his mom's man. That's weird. It just it's, it is weird. That, it makes that your movie, stomach tu- it makes your stomach turn. But that's one of the best horror movies to come out in like it really is 10, 20 years. I mean, it like really that, is. when when you get like really good, it's like. When you get like a really good script like that, and like killer actors that your actresses are just like they live in that world and like believe it, like you believe every single yeah you do you think it, of, you think it's no matter real. how fantastic it is, it's like it's like you're like this could really happen or something something right. crazy. It's almost like you think you're watching a documentary, you know, like something that went down. Exactly. Know? Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah, we do. We should totally do a horror movie. We should. Do I'm, something. I'm into it. I'm into it. Not hey. that much. To make one, you know. I've kept you long enough. I really appreciate your time doing this. Yeah. So I'm going to record this and then delete it all. And that'll be cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I, I, I really appreciate it. Caleb Johnson, uh, I hope to see you back on the road. I hope you come back on the road with us. Yeah, and, it'd be uh, awesome. And uh, let's, I'm, I'm going to text you, and we're going we're gonna to start writing our, our horror movie, and people can say they heard it here first. Damn right. It's starting. I love you, man. Stay safe. Love stay you. healthy. Yes, sir. You too. See you, partner. See you.